might bring me some more water. Okay, we're on. Thank you very much, for, and thank you very much, Wes, for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here last year. I was scheduled to come, and at the last minute I had a personal problem in the family and I had to cancel out. In fact, I canceled out the day I was supposed to be on the airplane. Uh, but uh, you people are fabulous. I've been to BC before, uh, Victoria, and um, uh, the Canadians are just wonderful, hospitable people. I really have a lot of respect for you. Uh, I have to say that it's all really quite by accident that I'm involved in these issues. I was in the FBI 27 and a half years, had a very illustrious career. I was uh, chosen as the Outstanding Law Enforcement Officer of the Year in 1977 by the AFL-CIO Middle Trades Council Los Angeles. Um, I was, um, at the time of my retirement, one of the top executives in the FBI. I was in charge of Southern California as the chief. Uh, I uh, had over 14 million people under my within my jurisdiction. I uh, retired. In fact, I retired early at the request of the Attorney General of the United States, who asked me to go to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and coordinate the security game, the uh, Pan American Games, in, in charge of security. I went down in the summer of '79 and uh, came back, established my own uh, consulting and international investigation business in Westwood Village, which is. Uh, in a part of L.A., right near uh, UCLA. And uh, then uh, subsequently I was a consultant for the 84 Olympics, and I was also a consultant for the California Narcotic Authority under then-Governor Jerry Brown. So uh, I've had a fantastic life, and uh, I really didn't know what it was all about. To be frank, the big, the big picture, the true story, until after I retired. And uh, what happened is shortly after my retirement, I was contacted by a group of doctors from Long Beach, California, and they said that their friend, Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald, had been tried and convicted of murdering his wife and two children at Fort Bragg. The murders occurred February 17, 1970. These doctor friends of Dr. McDonald said he was absolutely innocent. Would you investigate the case? Now, this is a case, by the way, uh, those of you, uh, some of you in this room, I'm sure, have seen the movie Fatal Vision. Would you raise your hands if you've seen the movie? It's a story, of, uh, it's been widely publicized as the best-selling book, Fatal Vision, by a guy named, a fellow named Joe McGinnis. So, uh, first thing I did was uh, go down and talk to Dr. McDonald. He was in prison at Terminal Island, San Pedro. And I told him, I said, Doctor, if you're innocent, uh, I'll work with you from now on. Guilty, I'm not gonna work the case. The child was five and a half, the other one was two and a half. Colette was pregnant. So the story is this. Dr. McDonald said he uh, had uh, come home that evening, uh, went up uh, to the back bedroom, this up uh, two steps into the hallway and then back to the back bedroom, to go to bed late. Uh, the five and a half year old child was sleeping with Colette, the wife. She'd wet the bed, so he came back and went back on the couch. He fell asleep watching uh, uh, Johnny Carson. He was awakened by two white males and a black male with these six sergeant stripes and a fatigue jacket, uh, and a white female with a floppy hat and the long blonde hair. And um, he, uh, they claimed, uh, later on I talked to the uh, female and got a signed confession from her, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. They claimed that uh, they came in looking for drugs. And um, he said, just a minute, I'll go uh, call a friend of mine and he went to call the friend, and uh, instead of calling the friend, of course, he called the MPs, and a fight ensued. Uh, they had a knife, a, a uh, ice pick, and the black male had a club. And uh, he was over near the couch, and somehow or other, his pajama tops got wrapped around his wrist, and he was fainting off the blows, and all of a sudden, he felt a sharp pain to his right side, and he said to, to himself, well, that guy packed a strong blow. He lost consciousness. He woke uh, halfway in the hallway and halfway in the living room, and there was dead silence in the house. He went back. His wife had uh, multiple stab wounds in, her, in his chest. He went in and checked the two little girls. They'd been bludgeoned to death with multiple stab wounds. He called the MP. Uh, the MPs came, and uh, a fellow named William F. Ivory was the chief investigator for the Criminal Investigation Division Department of the Army. The story goes later on that Ivory looked the area over, uh, looked at the upturned uh, furniture and the potted plant that had been uh, turned over, and decided, he decided right then and there, 
in 15 minutes that Jeffrey McDonald, Dr. McDonald, who was a Green Beret doctor at Fort Bragg, had staged these crimes. No motive, but he just decided to stage the crimes. The Army thereafter geared their investigation to prove the point that he was guilty. In America, of course, and up here, I think we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. I don't know if that's the way it is in Canada or not, but that's the way it should be. But the government claimed, even though they had no strong motive, uh, that he went up and the five and a half year old had wet the bed and he got in an argument with his wife and he slaughtered the whole family. Uh, absolutely uh, not true. The white male, the white female was chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Uh, Jeff, before he lost consciousness, heard his little daughter yell, Daddy, Daddy, help me, help me. He heard his wife yelling, Jeff, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? Why are they doing this to me? The, uh, the case uh, was tried in what, what we call an Article 32 Army hearing in uh, 1970, early 1970. And uh, as a result of the hearing, the Colonel Rock, who presided over the hearing, uh, said that Dr. McDonald did not commit these murders based on the evidence presented to him. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, civilian and the military personnel should go out and check into a group of individuals, a hippie group, uh, in the area. Uh, the group was, uh, one of the members was a girl named Helena Stokely. The reason Rock said to do that is because the MP, Kenneth Micah, in route to the scene that night, uh, had passed a girl on the corner uh, with a floppy white hat, long blonde hair, and uh, he said normally if he wasn't en route to a call, he would have stopped and asked about her, uh, but uh, he didn't. And when he arrived at the scene, he told uh, the lieutenant in charge, I think we should go check her out. They didn't go check her out. In addition to that, this girl, who her actual name was Helena Stokely, I was because she died in January 1983, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, Helena had mentioned to several people that she thought she was there that night, but she was high on drugs. Uh, long story short, they had a trial. In the trial, the judge said she's um, uh, a dopehead, she's not credible, and uh, there's no way that he was going to allow her to testify in front of the jury. In fact, she did not. Uh, when tried to, people tried to, to really pin her down, and tried to get a, a formal statement from her, she would say, oh, well, I'm confused that maybe I wasn't there. So they never did really, they never did really uh, have a conclusion to it through uh, what we'd call legal evidence, signed statements and so forth. But um, anyway, I entered the case knowing this, and I learned that her handler, she was a drug informant for the Fayetteville Police Department, and years later, years later, I learned that she was an informant for the Army, CID. Uh, and uh, the handler in the police department was a fellow named Prince Beasley, P.E. Beasley. And uh, in sizing up the case, I uh, went to Prince right away. I had to make up my mind whether he was an honest cop or he was dirty because right away I smelled drugs. And um, as a matter of fact, I was 100% right. It was a drug operation. It was a drug cover-up. And Prince had worked with this girl for years, and um, I decided that Prince was all right. He was an honest police officer. And Prince and I teamed up. So uh, the first thing we did was try to contact Lena because she had made these admissions but never had made any statements per se. And uh, we talked to her on the telephone through her brother in January, excuse me, um, uh, would have been in the January 1980, which is when I entered the case, right? And uh, Lena was not cooperative, told us to drop dead in so many words. Her husband, Ernie Davis, uh, also said, leave her alone. But in talking to her on the phone, I said, Lena, uh, look, I have inside information that you were there. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't have that information. It's a little trick that we play, right? But it works. I said, I have inside information that you were there, and my inside information, I really wasn't fibbing because I had information from people she had talked to, right? And I said, you better make it easy on yourself because if you'll cooperate with me and Prince, and give us the story now. Uh, we'll have your side of the story rather than getting it from some other source. I had planted a seed. There's no question about it. It's a technique I've used for years. Uh, but she still uh, would not cooperate. Uh, I go through uh, February, January, February, into the summer. I develop uh, 19 new witnesses. 
One of the witnesses was her next door neighbor, uh, William Posey. Uh, Bill Posey said she came home that morning, or the morning of the murders, about 4.30 in the morning. He saw her get out. She was in a blue Mustang. Another witness I developed was a woman in Dunkin' Donuts. She said around midnight, a group of hippies came in, a girl in a floppy white hat, uh, and sat there for quite a while, 45 minutes or so. And then uh, one of them said, let's get it over with, and got up and walked out. The girl had candles stuffed in her pockets. Uh, and, uh, and then another witness I developed was a woman named Jan Snyder. And uh, Jan was a neighbor of Dr. McDonald's. And uh, early in the morning, around 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, 345, 4 o'clock, she wasn't sure, she was awakened by the sound of idling motors. And she looked out the window. She saw a blue Mustang, a, a off-colored Plymouth, and a, a military Jeep, MP. She talked about uh, the one car was under the street light. Uh, there, the man that was sitting on the passenger side could very well be seen with at ease, a great deal of ease, because the light was shining right in his face. Well, right after the murders, Dr. McDonald had given artist conceptions of the two white males, the black male, and Alina Stokely. I showed these artist conceptions to Jan Snyder. She identified uh, the person sitting in the passenger side that night as a fellow named Alan Mazarel. Uh, I showed the uh, picture uh, to the lady in Dunkin' Donuts, Frankie Bushy. She identified the girl as Helena Stokely, the girl in the floppy hat, from these artist conceptions. So I knew I was uh, on the right track. Um, now, what happened was, um, again, I developed these 19 new witnesses. Um, I went on into uh, the summer, didn't hear from Elena. And in October, Prince called me and said that Ernie Davis, Helena's uh, husband, had beaten her up and Ernie was in jail. We needed $200 to get him out. Nobody would bail him out. I, I, sent, I wired Prince $200 and said, Prince, go down and bail him out if he will come to California and talk to us. Prince went down, we bailed him out, we brought him to California, and he gave us a statement. And the information he gave us basically indicated that Alina was at the crime scene that night based on what Alina had told him. So on the way to the airport, they let him go back to, he had to go back to uh, North Carolina and uh, appear at a hearing because of the uh, fact that he was out on bail. Uh, we're on the way to the airport, and I said to Prince, they're in the back of my car and I'm driving. You know, that new witness we have is really going to help us. I pretended like I made a mistake, and I said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And uh, sure enough, it worked. Ernie went back to South Carolina, North Carolina, got out of the car. I found out later I had made up with Alina in the meantime, told Alina, we got to get out of here. They have somebody on the inside. He went down to South Carolina, and uh, the kind of, bear in mind, I'm about to lose 200 bucks, right, from the bail money that I sent for Ernie. Uh, and uh, so uh, er, uh, Prince finds out where they are in South Carolina, told Prince to tell the local authorities. The local authorities wouldn't do anything about it. I told Prince, go down on your own and, and arrest him. Prince did, brought him back. And uh, after he arrested Ernie, uh, Helena was uh, there about five hours away. Helena told uh, Ernie, his, her husband, well, I'll hitchhike back. And uh, Prince said, no, nah, no, nah, get in the car. I will give you a ride back. So. They got in the car, the husband and wife, Ernie and Helena, and uh, Prince kind of stirred them up a little bit, got them to arguing, and uh, Helena said, well, you know, I think I will go back and talk to Gunderson, and uh, that's uh, all Ernie needed to do. And when they got out in North Carolina, Ernie attacked Helena, knocked her to the ground even though he had handcuffs on, and uh, they got this under control, put him in jail, and Helena turned to Prince and said, let's go back and talk to Gunderson. We brought Helena back, uh, to, uh, uh, Prince brought Helena back to uh, Los Angeles, sat down, talked to her, got a, took a statement, signed the statement on October 25, 1980. Helena basically told, I'm working up to this case because I want you to have the background. That this is the reason that I got into these issues about Satanism. Helena told us that she was a member of a Satanic group. It was her initiation into the group that night. She was the one that was yelling, asking this groovy kill the pigs. Uh, she talked to us about a, uh, when they entered the house, there was a, a German shepherd uh, that barked as they left but didn't bark when they entered. She told us about a rocking horse in the child's bedroom. The spring is broken. She couldn't ride it. She wouldn't have known that if she hadn't been in there that night. She told us about um, the uh, satanic um, uh, um, ceremony itself. 
we learned that uh, Bruce Fowler and the Blue Mustang had dropped the group off about a, a half a mile from Dr. McDonald's house. And they walked through the neighborhood chanting and with candles and robes and uh, en route to the, to the house. And this was part of the ceremony. One of the neighbors, a fellow named Milne, saw this, by the way. Uh, she also told us uh, and identified the uh, artist's conceptions as uh, Alan Mazarel, Dwight Smith, a fellow named Shelby Don Harris, and of course she identified herself. I asked Aline, I said, uh, now during this whole procedure, and she said that uh, Greg Mitchell, one of the other assailants, was in the back and fighting with uh, Colette. I said, Alina, did anything unusual happen that night? She said, no. Now, by the way, every, every time you talk to these people, you have them on audio tape, and if you can, videotape. In those days, I used audio tape. This was uh, 20, 20 years ago. I said, uh, think real hard, Alina, did anything unusual happen? And uh, she said, no. The third time I said, think real hard, because I, I knew from my investigation that somebody had called in that night in the middle of the murders and tried to talk to Dr. McDonald on the telephone. And she finally says, yes, that something did happen. I said, what happened? You see, you have to answer, you have to quiz them this way because you can't put words in their mouth. She said, well, right in the middle of the ordeal, a phone rang. I said, tell me about the conversation. She said, somebody asked for Dr. McDonald. And uh, she said that uh, I laughed. And Dwight Smith said, hang up the GD phone, and I hung up the phone. In the meantime, there was another investigator before me who had talked to the person who made that phone call, and that's why I knew about it. So this confirmed, in my mind, that she was there. Now, the CID had come in, as I said. They basically uh, made the uh, statement that uh, they thought McDonald was uh, guilty. Uh, another person that she refused to identify, by the way, was a fellow named Wizard. She said and claimed she did not know Wizard's name. I have learned just recently that Wizard was a fellow named uh, Francis Winterborn, and Wizard was a member of the Process Church of Final Judgment. Do you, any, you pe pe people know what the Process Church of Final Judgment is? It's a satanic group, uh, mainly out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it was established in England, and they settled in the San Francisco, I mean, the, uh, the LA area. Excuse me, yeah, the Los Angeles area, the Pasadena area. Uh, so we have now Helena saying that it was a satanic cult group. It was her initiation. She told us that the uh, individuals involved in the group, Alan Mazarel in particular, uh, were distributing drugs up and down the East Coast from New York to Florida after they were brought in in plastic bags in the body cavities of the dead GIs. And uh, these were brought in not only at Fort Bragg, but all over the United States. It was a large-scale drug operation. She told us about two attorneys being involved in it, generals being involved in it, police officers, and others in the Fayetteville area. So I knew by this time that uh, this was a big operation, and this was the reason that the CID refused to investigate. Uh, during the trial, there was an uh, FBI agent named Paul Stombaugh, and he claimed, uh, he took the pajama tops of Dr. McDonald, did an analysis of the ec entry and exit wounds, knife and t ice pick through the pajama tops, and uh, which were the entry, which were the exits. And then uh, just before trial, uh, Brian Murtaugh, the prosecutor, said, can you take those pajama tops and make a pattern by placing them on the stab wounds, the 21 stab wounds in Colette's chest? There were 48 uh, knife wounds and stab wounds in the pajama top. And they did, and the jury bought it. Unfortunately, it was a fraud. He had to reverse the direction, exit entry, of six holes after he already made that conclusion. And also, when you think of it logically, if you put a piece of cloth on an individual and you stab them, it's going to move after each stab, right? So there's no way you're going to establish a perfect pattern on that. Uh, I was surprised to learn that once I entered the case, the attorneys had not um, si filed for Freedom of Information Act requests. So I filed for Freedom of Information Act requests, and uh, it, it was in 1980. We didn't start receiving any material until 1983. The government tried to block us. Once we started receiving material, we checked the, uh, the documents that the government sent to us. We learned that skin under Colette's fingernails, Colette the wife, uh, was given to William Ivory, it disappeared. Now, you and I know from skin, you can tell the DNA of the person who was scratched. Dr. McDonald did not have any scratch marks on him. We learned uh, that 
the uh, fingerprint expert uh, lost, deliberately threw away, didn't lose, he deliberately threw away seven fingerprints because they were unknown and he said they kept becoming confused with the known fingerprints of other individuals who were there. We learned that there were some bloody syringes uh, that were in the, uh, ba the uh, uh, bedroom that night uh, that uh, nobody told the defense about. Bloody syringes did not belong to Dr. McDonald. This is something they would, could have and could have used in a satanic ceremony. Uh, we learned that there were fibers. Uh, we knew there were fibers in certain locations where McDonald fought with the uh, assailants, yet they were not listed on the government chart. And uh, as I said earlier, we also learned that Helena Stokely was an informant for the Army herself, which would account for the fact that they didn't want uh, to uh, place her at the crime scene. So uh, we also developed information through the Freedom of Information Act that the FBI had obtained a confession from Kathy Perry, who was there that night also, and from Greg Mitchell. Uh, the FBI didn't interview him. He refused to cooperate, but Greg Mitchell had told one of his neighbors that he was there uh, that night. I learned during my investigation that the, uh, one of the prosecutors, Jim, James Proctor, was a former son-in-law of the judge, Judge Dupree, so we had a conflict of interest. It was, um, the judge, by the way, refused to recuse himself, and um, he um, stuck steadfast uh, as judge of the case through all the hearings. We, um, I developed information about uh, uh, one of, uh, later, years later, about one of Dr. McDonald's attorneys. He was involved in a large-scale drug operation. He ended up being murdered in Philadelphia. Uh, one of his attorneys at the present time uh, is a member of the Process Church of Final Judgment which you find that kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, I told Dr. McDonald this. Uh, this fellow, John Markham, is uh, with the law firm of Silverglade out of Boston, who is the chief attorney for Dr. McDonald, and uh, they've assured me that he does not have access to the files, but I still don't believe it. Uh, there was hair in Colette's hand. Paul Stombaugh lied about the hair. They took a piece of hair out of every part of Dr. McDonald's body. It didn't match the hair in her hand. Stombaugh claimed that it was uh, Colette's hair herself. You cannot make a statement like that. Hair can only be similar. There were foreign wax drippings in the house that did not match any of the wax that was, uh, or the candle that was in the house that night. Uh, there were wool fibers, we found out again years later. Two uh, wool fibers, two on her lip, Colette's lip, one on her chest, and two on the club. It was a 32-inch uh, bed slap, by the way. Um, the uh, CID and the uh, FBI laboratory classified these wool fibers as blue cotton polyester. On the official type report, it said blue cotton polyester. Once we went behind the scenes and looked at the laboratory handwriting notes of the expert, it said wool. There was no wool in the house that night, no black wool in the house that night. So I felt pretty good at this point about the, my investigation. Uh, we had uh, Prince Beasley, who saw uh, Helena that night, by the way, before the murders, about 10.50 p.m., and she was with a black male with a, a fatigue jacket, E6 Argent, Sergeant Stripes, at the Apple House, a local hangout for hippies. At uh, 12.15, we had um, Helena through uh, Artist Conception, through Bank Frankie Bushy at the Dunkin' Donuts. A little after uh, midnight, we had uh, Milne, uh, talking about the ceremony, uh, walking down the street in robes, chanting with candles en route to the McDonald House. Uh, we had the dog barking. Helena said that there was a dog that barked, and there was a dog that barked that night because Janice Pendleshock, the lady to whom the dog belonged, said that her dog barked that night. Jan Snyder identified uh, Alan Mazarell from the artist conception that we had, and we had a 4.30, 4.45, Helena's uh, neighbor, Bill Posey, uh, confirmed that she came in late that night in a blue Mustang. Other witnesses identified uh, themselves, uh, the, the group, with a blue Mustang. So I kind of sit back. Oh, by the way, the latest development on the case is this. You won't believe this. You will not believe this, I assure you. We have finally, finally been able to get the courts to agree to a DNA test. They agreed to do a DNA test on this case in 19... 97, three years ago, still have not done the test. 
Now, the judge said that you can open up 15 pieces of evidence envelope, 15 envelopes for evidence, but the defense cannot be present, only the prosecution can be present. So they opened up the envelopes, and of the 15 envelopes that were opened, five of them are empty. Three years later, we still haven't done the test. So I'm feeling pretty good. I think that we have an open and shut case. And all my years as an FBI agent, very frankly, I'd never failed to interview a suspect or solve a case. It was a great record, except one case I had in New Mexico, in Kirtland Air Force Base, as an old uh, bank uh, burglary. They blew a safe and all that. And, uh, but I got the case reassigned from somebody to me, so it really wasn't mine from the inception. But I'd never lost a case. I'd always obtained a confession. I felt good. I said, you know, we're going to turn this report over, 1,200-page report, to the FBI, and this man's going to be out in no time at all. That was in 1981, the spring of 81. Well, next thing, and I wrote a letter to Judge Webster, a personal letter. Webster was a friend of mine. I'd worked for him. I was one of the top executives in the Bureau, as I said. Probably one of the top uh, dozen jobs in the, in the FBI. Never received a response. I said, dear Judge, I have this... 1,200-page report I'm sending to you. I think this man's innocent, and I think that you should look into the possibility of his innocence. We run out of money. I set forth 45 leads, leads that should be covered, and I said I, I would appreciate it if the FBI would continue with my investigation. Next thing I hear, I'm receiving phone calls from throughout the United States. I understand you're a homosexual. No. Yeah. I understand the words being spread that you're suffering from mental problems. That's probably true, I wouldn't be involved in these issues. Uh, that, uh, that you were a disgruntled ex-employee. And Tom Kelly, the agent in charge in Dallas at that time, even told a good friend of mine that I was trafficking drugs. So what are they going to do with an ex-FBI chief who comes along with a case like this and basically solve them. They have to discredit me. Why do they discredit me? Large-scale drug operation. Drugs being flown in from Southeast Asia. A CIA Army operation, joint venture operation. Now, for confirmation of that documentation, January 1, 1973, Time Magazine had an article on it. That's the only article I've ever seen about that drug operation in a national publication. OK? So I submit my 1,200-page report. And uh, basically, uh, I am accused of all these uh, various nefarious activities, uh, homosexuality and what have you. And then the next thing I hear is uh, that um, my witnesses are all being re-interviewed by the FBI. And in particular, Alina Stokely. And uh, so they go out and try to get them to recuse and change their statement. I'm saying to myself, you know, the FBI is supposed to solve cases, not unsolved cases. And the government isn't being paid to go out and take a fact and interview a person and try and get them to change a the story. These guys are supposed to go out and corroborate the information that I have. Well, it um, didn't work out that way. They uh, interviewed Helena, and um, in talking to Helena, uh, she refused to recant, but she was upset with me because there had been a big article in the Washington Post magazine, and I had arranged through the reporter for the article about the case and about her confession, and there was a picture of Helena in the magazine, she had in the uh, newspaper. She just obtained a babysitting job, and what do you think happened? when the parents of the baby saw her picture as a baby killer in the Washington Post newspaper. She lost her job. She was mad at me. And the FBI, obviously, with their wiretaps or whatever they were doing, uh, felt this was a good time to go talk to Lena. And they went and talked to Lena, and they tried to get her to recant. She didn't recant, but she did say she was upset with me, which was all right. I've had a lot of people upset with me. So uh, we rocked along. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to the uh, re-interview with Helena or with the others because I knew that the information I developed would stand and stand solid uh, because of the audio tapes. And in one instance, later, in uh, May of 1982, 
I even put her on videotape. After she was contacted by the FBI and they tried to get her to recant, she called me in May of 82. This was the FBI interviewed her in, in the summer of 81. She called me in May of 82 and she said, Ted, I want to talk to you. So I flew to South Carolina. She told me about the FBI interviews, told me she didn't recant and uh, reiterated uh, information about the murders and about the drug operation and said that if she would be given immunity, she would tell all. She would give the names of the generals, the names uh, of the attorneys, and the names of the police officers and everybody involved and the people that were distributing the drugs. I sent uh, a letter to the Department of Justice asking for immunity for Alina uh, and uh, her attorney or not her attorney, but uh, Jeff McDonald's attorney, I found out I did it, and um, he killed the letter. I don't know, I have my reasons why I think he killed it, but he killed the letter, wrote to the department, said don't pay any attention to Gunderson and his request. So um, then um, I received a phone call from Jeff McDonald's attorney, Brian O'Neill. O'Neill gave me a new case, only case he'd ever given me before or since. A fellow named Robert Ferrante had uh, walked out of his office about midnight, had nothing to do with the McDonald case, by the way, had uh, walked out of his house about midnight, not house, but his office, and um, as he started to get in his car, a gunman, a gunman jumped out of the bushes and uh, shot at him nine times, hit him five, but he lived. So O'Neill asked me to investigate the case. I found out that the afternoon or the evening late early evening of the day of the shooting, that a, an individual was seen in the parking lot by the accountant uh, with the trunk of the car up against the building, and he was sitting there, and uh, at the time of the shooting, the same car, a car of that same description was also there. And so I took the accountant and we put him under hypnosis and we did an artist conception. I came up with an artist conception. I gave it to my client, Ferrante, who lived, by the way, and the first thing he said when he got to the hospital, when the police started asking questions about who shot him and so forth, he said, um, I'm taking the fifth, so it tells you a little bit about him. And um, so my client had this artist's conception. And uh, next thing uh, I know, my landlady uh, leaves a note on my car. One night I didn't go home, and I got up the next uh, day after that, and she said that, um, She'd come home at 1.30 in the morning, and there were two men sitting across from my front door. One of them got out and walked over and asked if she knew where Ted Gunderson lived. And I'd always told her, you, didn't, you don't know me, you don't know where I've lived, if anybody ever asked. And she said no, and then she went up and watched him. At a quarter or two, they left, these two men in the car. So I checked with some of my informants, and I found out at that time that there was a contract out on me. Um, now. I had uh, given this artist's conception to my client, Ferrante, and uh, I found out later that Ferrante took it uh, to uh, some Israelis that he was involved in a lawsuit with and um, told them, my detective Gunderson is going to solve this case and here's an artist's conception of one of the people involved in the shooting. Well, that was the wrong thing for him to do, obviously. I didn't know he did this. So a uh, long story short, um, I had a did some checking, I had a contract out on me by the Israeli Mafia. And um, then the next thing I know, um, by the way, as soon as I found out about these two guys sitting in the car across the front door from me, I checked in a motel with cash and stayed there for a week and I had some friends staying at my place. And uh, the following Friday, there were 13 dead red roses and 13 dead chrysanthemums placed on my front porch. When my friend got up, walked over, opened the door to get the newspaper, there were these dead roses and dead chrysanthemums. They were dried and they'd been painted black. So I called uh, my, two of my sources and I said, what does that mean? One of them says it means it's probably hit on you. And uh, the other one said, if, it's not, if there's not a hit, there's, you're, you're, that's a warning to back off. Um, so I'm saying, you know, I think I better get out of Dodge. And um, but before I do, I got to make an effort to get these contracts taken care of. Now, I'm telling you about these now because these contracts fit right back into the government and the work that I'm doing, okay? I'm laying the groundwork for you. So I contact a couple of my sources again. And by the way, in this business, you're only as good as your sources and your contacts and your confidential informants. 
And um, they're both ex-cons, and I say, can you help me out? And they say, sure, let's go see so-and-so. So I won't name him. But this fellow that we went to see was cocaine king of the West Coast. Uh, so we make an appointment on a Monday after the Friday that the roses and the chrysanthemums are dumped on my front porch. And uh, we go up to the front door, knock on the door, and the guy in the artist's conception answers the door. So I'm saying, I wonder if I got the wrong house here. And of course I didn't. But at that point we went in. I knew they weren't going to do anything to three of us. So we went in, we sat in a parlor. He had a couple of females in there he's playing pool with. Uh, rough, rough looking guy, a rough guy himself, tough guy, hit man obviously, or at least involved with the hit team. And then uh, pretty soon he took us into a side room. Wait here. The cocaine king of the West Coast came in. By the way, before he came in, his dog came in. Smelled all of us, sat down at my feet, and went to sleep. And he came in and he said, my dog likes you, I like you. And he told the other fellows to get out of the room. I'm sitting there, and uh, first question he asked me is, um, how many children do you have? What he was saying is, you know, if you don't do, you play your cards right, your kid's health's in danger. And I told him, and then he took the artist's conception out and handed it to me, see, where'd this come from? And I told him, I says, you know, if you're going to do anything to the person that gave this to me, I'm not going to tell you. I'll take the heat myself. And he was kind of set back and offended by that. And I, and I said, no, I, I won't tell you where it came from. And he said, finally, he says, okay, I won't do anything. I said, well, I told him the story about how Robert Ferrante's accountant walked through the parking lot at 6.30 and this uh, car was sitting there, artist conception and so forth. So I guess he admired me standing up to him or what, I don't know, whatever it was, either his dog or something. He said, uh, let me leave the room, I'll be right back. He left the room, came back 15 minutes later, you got two contracts set on you. He says, I can take care of one, but I can't take care of the other one. I can't take care of the one out of Florida and Houston. Um, but he could take care of the one involved in the Israeli mafia. This was on a Monday. He said, don't go back to your office or home until Friday. So um, I took care of the one, and then I had to go underground. I had to leave the area. Uh, I went to work for F. Lee Bailey for about uh, six or eight months. As a matter of fact, I handled that investigated that drunk driving case he had in uh, San Francisco, California. For six weeks I was there. Then I was in Dallas most of the time. Uh, did some work for him in Amarillo, Texas and in New Mexico. It took me a while to get the second hit taken off and I found out that the second contract was by the satanic cult group out of Florida and Houston. And um, the way I did that is um, I made some more phone calls and I was placed in contact with an individual who was reported to me as head of the hit squad for George Bush's White House team. He was NSC, National Security Council. The National Security Agency handles communications. The National Security Council is right out of the White House. They don't answer to anybody but the President of the United States. They don't answer to Congress, to anybody. The FBI answers to the Department of Justice. CIA uh, answers uh, to who knows who the CIA answers to. They're supposed to answer to Congress, but they don't. They have so many black ops that nobody can keep track of them. So um, I uh, fly to L.A., have a meeting with this individual, and um, he tries to drink me under the table, and one day I could drink with anybody. I don't drink anymore, basically. And I think because I, he couldn't drink me under the table, he admired me, respected me, which is kind of a stupid thing to think about, but that's the way those, some of those people are. And we developed a very close relationship. He ended up taking the second hit off, uh, a contract off on, for me. Incidental of that, I was placed in, uh, in the company of a number of CIA type individuals and, and people. And uh, I was uh, right then, told right then and there that, you know, you better be careful, you better back off, uh, you better forget about um, getting into these issues. I didn't. Uh, this uh, fellow and I are no longer friends, by the way. But then I started having a series of surveillances and phone calls, uh, and uh, I've had uh, not only those two gunmen waiting for me, I had a gunman waiting for me, a fellow named Bill Menser in 1986 in Calabasas. I was living in Calabasas. I don't need to go into details on that, but I did confirm that he had uh, come into my house, waited for me from 11 till 2 in the morning. Bill Menser is a satanic cult drug killer for the government. 
Uh, he was convicted subsequently, by the way, for the murder of a Hollywood producer named Roy Radin out of Long Island, New York. And um, I was partly responsible for that conviction. So uh, I not only sent him up, but his three accomplices. And instead of getting me, I got him, and he's in jail now for life. All four of them are. I had another case, um, a fellow um, uh, was um, CIA. And um, I learned that uh, he was arranging for contract killings. And I went to the FBI with the information. They wouldn't do anything. I went to the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. They began an investigation. Pretty soon the investigators pulled off, put on stolen cars. And so I go to the chief of police, uh, Sam Cross in Indio, which is where the fellow was from. And I knew Sam, and I said, Sam, this guy's arranging for contract killings. And um, Sam said, well, I don't like that. I said, that's good. I said, here. What are you going to do about it? I'll, I'll take care of it. He sent a young cop in right out of training school. The cop was wired. And uh, this individual was caught with uh, arranging for five contract killings. Am I on the mic back there? Um, so he ends up. All right, OK. So he ends up. Uh, um, going to jail for three years, and when he got out, he arranged uh, to have Mincer come after me. Um, so the surveillances that I had were, uh, were rather obvious. They, were, they would wait uh, half a block up from my home, just sit there. And um, I'd spot them, and I would uh, put my gun on, get in my car, and uh, drive up about three miles an hour, look at them, do a U-turn, three miles an hour back, do it again, then come in and park behind them. And uh, they'd get nervous, and I'd be watching them in the rearview mirror. I'd be behind them watching them. And all of a sudden, they'd take off. I had two of those. One fellow, I cornered him down around the corner. He thought I was going to do something to him, and his eyes got, you know, big as saucers. Another uh, incident was in Long Island, not Long Island, but uh, Long Beach. Uh, I was walking my, my uh, staying with my daughters, walking my dog one midnight, and I saw some fellow about a quarter of a block up sitting in a car darkened. And uh, so I walked back with the dogs, put them in, put my gun on, went up, walked up to the front of the car with my paper and pen and started writing his license number down, walked around the back of the car, wrote his license number down, walked up to the window. I said, get out. I know who you are. I've, been, I've seen your type before. And the guy's going like this and locking all his doors. And he says, he says, no, no, I'm waiting for somebody. I said, yeah, I've heard that story before. And just about this time, I hear the door open across the street in a house. And it was true he was waiting for somebody. <laughs> So I said, gee, you know, I'm sorry. Thanks very much. And, I, and I, I didn't walk right to my daughter's house. I didn't want him to know where I lived. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I've laid the groundwork for, uh, it was, I mean, here I am. Here I'm an ex-FBI chief, uh, come out with all kinds of honors. I solve this case, involves drugs, involves the government, involves contract killers, hit CIA, and all this. And I'm saying, what in the hell is going on in America? I just can't believe it. I have this 1,200-page report that's being ignored. Uh, uh, FBI agents are lying on the witness stand, which was Paul Stombaugh. By the way, I found out later that in a magazine article, one Paul M. Stombaugh was expelled from Russia because he was a CIA agent. I find that very interesting. I also learned that there was an individual on the McDonald defense team who was a contract attorney for the CIA for years. So they're planting. They planted people on me. They planted people on McDonald. I've had at least a half a dozen people planted on me. And um, what did they do? How did they justify the wiretaps on me? Well, I had a fellow named Bill Craig, CIA, by the way, say that he had a friend named Mark Tilden. Now, I can name these names because I hope they do sue me, who was, uh, had some information that he wanted to pass on to the White House. Uh, Mark Tilden, uh, supposedly, uh, I talked to him. I said, what do you want? What do you, why can't you go through the CIA? He says, well, he said, I need to get right to the White House and go right into the Reagan administration. I don't trust the CIA. He said, OK. So I made a phone call to Washington. I arranged for Mark Tilden to go into the White House. Uh, I, even, I was back in Washington at the, uh, sometime later when he was there. I even escorted him to the side door. And he got out of the car and went on in. I found out later Mark Tilden was actually a KGB agent named Rotor Ivanov, spoke perfect English, 
I was set up by Bill Craig with Ivanov, otherwise known as uh, Mark Tilden, in order to justify the FBI to do a counter-espionage or an espionage investigation of me and to run their wiretaps legally in the interest of national defense. Um, under the Freedom of Information Act, I requested information from the FBI, and I found out that I had four investigations of me. Obviously, this is one of them. So from there, uh, I just kept on going. Surveillances that didn't matter. Uh, I had my, my uh, phone staffed in my office. I had a, a contact inside the phone company, and um, I knew my phones were being tapped, but if I came forward with the information, I'd have to expose my source, and he'd be fired, and maybe even prosecuted, so I couldn't do that. So I lived with it. And then one day, I received a bill, um, and I had an office manager before this, but I had to let her go because my finances were going down, down, down. And uh, I was paying my own, writing my own checks, and I received this bill, and I looked at it. It was from the phone company, and it said, 40 some, $42, $7 a mile for the extension to your telephone answering service. And I'm saying to myself, that's funny because I don't have a telephone answering service there. I've got another one. So I called the phone company. I said, would you give me that in a letter and so on and so forth? And they did. And uh, what they were doing, uh, they had a answer all telephone answering service on 5900 West Pico in Los Angeles. And they were running that as a front and tapping all kinds of telephones. I went down there. By the time I got down there, there were about 150 lines coming in. Somebody had cut the lines coming into the building and um, made off with all their equipment. So I filed a lawsuit against GTE. Um, I couldn't get an attorney to handle it. I finally had an attorney that went just so far. We got up to the first deposition, and he wanted out. I think he was paid off, to be honest with you. And so I settled out of court for a minimal fee. So I had these wiretaps. I, had, I was a homosexual and uh, suffering from mental problems and uh, what have you, uh, but, and had the surveillances on me. Uh, it didn't bother me. I just kept right on going. I became involved in the case in Nebraska. It's called the Franklin Cover-Up. And in that particular case, I learned uh, that they were, uh, uh, there was an international child kidnapping ring operating out of Iowa, Nebraska. They had, uh, the Franklin Savings and Loan was raided by the IRS and the FBI. As a result of the publicity, 80 children came forward and said that they were part victims in a large-scale pedophile ring. Of the 80 who came forward, four gave statements, two recanted, two refused to recant, Lee Owens and Paul Benassi. Uh, the two refused to recant. I went back and interviewed them. I talked to them. I helped develop the case. The investigator before me was murdered, by the way. And uh, the, uh, I, I didn't really replace him because he was a full-time investigator. And John DeCamp had just asked me to come back and kind of fill in until we could uh, you know, uh, work it more extensively. Uh, but we we learned from talking to these kids that uh, this large-scale pedophile ring was not only involved in pedophilia, they were involved in pornography, uh, they were um, involved in satanic cult activity. Uh, the kids were uh, attended these ceremonies with robe chanting, human sacrifices, uh, and uh, these were not dirt bags off the street. This was the past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. This was the chief of police, Bob Wadman. This was the head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, Eugene Mahoney. These kids named all these individuals, some of the top citizens in Omaha, Nebraska. So um, the case went actually nowhere. The main agency that blocked it, kept it from going forward, was the FBI. But uh, they were taking these kids out of orphanages, foster homes, Boys Town. They were driving them in pr uh, private limousines from Omaha, Nebraska to Sioux City, Iowa, placing them in private jets, flying them to Washington, D.C. Uh, for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. And of course, they would blackmail the congressmen and the senators. Uh, Paul Benassi, one of the kids who was talking, uh, told me about how when he, he was, by, by this time, he was about 21, 22 years old, told me how when he was uh, 14, 15, 16, uh, they would take him out and uh, to a shopping mall, a park, uh, a public place to try to attract the kids over uh, his age, over near the car. The adults would grab them, make off with them, and put these kids in a safe house and um, so forth. Paul told me, asked me, I said, what do they do with these kids, Paul? He said, well, they auction them off, and uh, he'd been to two, such, uh, two locations, uh, Las Vegas and Toronto, Canada. 
I said, how many auctions have you attended? He said, six. And uh, I said, how many kids were auctioned off at each one? He said, there were as few as six and as many as 36. I said, how, many, uh, how much money do, these, do they get for one of these kids? They're, they sell for $50,000. 36 times $50,000 is a bundle of money. What happens to the kids afterwards, Paul? They're using satanic ceremonies. Uh, they're put on airplanes, uh, foreigners that don't speak English, planes with no markings on them. Now, wait a minute, FAA's got to be involved in that. We got planes coming in here with no markings? Huh? Or, they're or whatever. Um, they're uh, put in campers. Um, they're uh, sent overseas, probably for, uh, well, I've been told, uh, for body parts, for sex slaves, and what have you. In uh, November the 7th, uh, 1997, I was in Denver, Colorado on a lecture. We picked up information that a car, an airplane, uh, with the children from Child Protective Services in the state of Colorado was serviced at Denver International Airport. There were two men and a, and a female woman, and the fellow that serviced the airplane asked, what are those kids doing here? There were 210 kids. And she said, Child Protective Services, none of your business. The plane, he checked the manifest, the plane was uh, going to New York to refuel and then going on to Paris, France. Big business, right? So Paul said that um, he was part of the kidnap ring. There have been several attempts to, uh, to kill Paul. John DeCamp, an attorney, filed a lawsuit against Larry King, who was the leader of the operation and the president of the Franklin Savings and Loan. Not uh, Larry King uh, live TV, but a black man. And uh, he had a million dollar judgment uh, February the 9th of uh, last year. Received a million dollar judgment. So we do have some good documentation. I have the, the documentation paying the telephone company, I mean the pe telephone company paying me. We got the million dollar uh, judgment and so forth. Um, so um, in addition to the Nebraska case, uh, later in uh, 1990, the spring of 1990, how many of you have heard of the, the McMartin case? McMartin case was a preschool, Manhattan Beach, California, longest trial in the history of the country, two years. The kids said uh, that when they were dropped off in the morning by their parents, picked up at night, between that time they were uh, victims of a satanic ceremony. There were tunnels under the school. Uh, they had witnessed uh, human sacrifices. Uh, they were flown into the mountains for ceremonies. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, authorities uh, said that, well, these kids are all hallucinating. The kids um, um, claimed that, that there were these tunnels. They said that they told uh, the authorities where the entrance was and everything else. The authorities went out there in 1987, couldn't find any tunnels. In the spring of 1990, I heard that the property had been sold from the McMartin to, and given to Danny Davis, the attorney, and he had sold it to a contract. They were going to build uh, an office building on the property. And uh, so I went to the contractor. I said, uh, would you do me a favor? Let me have that property for two weeks. And um, he said, yeah, but you've got to sign liability. You've got to sign a contract. Went to an attorney friend of mine, and he wrote up a contract. And uh, I went out there. And at the end of two weeks, by the way, we couldn't document there had been tunnels under the school. But we did uh, extend it up to 34 days. And right at the very beginning, we hired a, an archaeologist, Dr. Stickle from UCLA. And we, he brought his team of archaeologists out. And uh, we found tunnels under the school that had been filled in. And. Um, the kids said that they were taken through these tunnels up into the triplex next door. There was a trap door in the bathroom. And they were placed in automobiles and transported out in the community, two, three, four-year-old kids for prostitution purposes. And I found, I found a book, by the way, in uh, my research, How to Have Sex with uh, Babies, Infants. Uh, and uh, these people are sicko. Um, the kids were telling the truth. There's no question about it. There was a, the first trial was a hung jury for Bray Bucky, and his uh, grandmother was acquitted. We were right in the middle of the second trial when we found the tunnels. Uh, I called the investigator. He came out, Mr. Perez. He wanted to argue with the archaeologist and say there were no tunnels. He said, what are you talking about? And uh, we, they could have used uh, the evidence for the, the tunnels in the second trial. They didn't. They refused. Uh, before the case, right after the case broke, I knew where the kids were flown. They were, there was an airport about 10 minutes away. Uh, at Hawthorne Airport, 
uh, one of the friends of the, of the McMartin family had a jet, private jet. Uh, Crestline was about a 20 minute uh, flight from uh, Hawthorne Airport. I uh, was tipped off that this is where the kids were taken. I went up there, I took pictures. Um, I have those pictures, by the way. I usually show them at, uh, at m when I uh, give a lecture when we don't have the facilities here. And uh, there's no question about it. That was the location. I talked to the prosecutor before, before the first trial. And by the way, the house on this property burned down the day that the um, publicity broke on the McMartin case. And I talked to the uh, prosecutor. I said, this has to do uh, with Satanism. And uh, I know where the kids were taken based on everything that I've been able to develop. I'll be glad to take you up there, take the kids up there. We're not interested. Now, what, what did the kids do? Well, you know who they identified? Household name actor, baseball players, professional, professional football players, the son of the most prominent politician in Los Angeles. It cost the Los Angeles taxpayers $15 million, by the way. That case did. So um, what do you have? Well, let's see. We've got cover-up in the McDonald case. We've got cover-up in the Nebraska case. Now, most recently in the Nebraska case, Franklin cover-up, the photographer, Rusty Nelson, uh, when the case broke, he disappeared. And he was the official photographer, and he went to Washington, D.C., took pictures with the congressmen and the senators, and uh, we found out that he had taken some pictures on his own and mailed them back to his family for, for his insurance, right? We also learned that uh, Gary Caradore, the investigator before me, had flown to Chicago, met with Rusty. Rusty gave him a briefcase full of pornographic pictures with these prominent citizens in sexual acts. And um, Gary Caradore, the investigator, called uh, a state senator that night that uh, Rusty gave him these pictures, he said, Senator, I've got the smoking gun. 